Welcome to Crossing the Chasm. On today's episode, we look back on the first year. I'm excited to welcome back Dan Phillips and Cody Bayless, both psychologists who started the Wellness Collective Beyond the Pines here in Flagstaff. And more importantly, they began a couple of years ago their own podcast, Beyond Flag, FLG. It was in that podcast that they introduced me to it. They invited me on the show and we had a nice conversation and that began a broader conversation about creating another podcast, which then led to Crossing the Chasm. We've had a very interesting year, lots of interesting guests, and today we're just going to chat about our thoughts on what we had intended for the podcast and where it's gone. I'm super excited to have them back. We began this whole project by having a conversation with the three of us to discuss our interests, some ideas we had. And so now today we're going to reflect on what's transpired and where we might go from here. As always, thanks so much for listening, and I hope you enjoy the conversation. Dan and Cody, welcome back to Crossing the Chasm. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I I especially appreciate that... uh, in your introduction and saying hello, you said my name first. Yeah, that was important to both of us. <laughs> Good to see you, amigo. <laughs> There's no favoritism here. <laughs> um, it's hard not to interpret it that way, but it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's nice to have you both back. It was over a year ago when we sat down in this office and started a discussion about what eventually became Crossing the Chasm. We had some ideas, we had some thoughts. I am super excited about where it's gone and the guests we've had and so forth. And I just wanted to invite you both back and have a little reflection on where we've been and where we're going. Yeah. What, what came out of, what manifested out of those uh, days of flipping the frizz? I was going to say, I think my shins are finally healed from those, uh, those experiences out there in the field, taking a frisbee to the shin. (laughs) And it's nice weather again. Uh, you know, we're going to be back out there. So, um, Prepare yourself for yeah. more bruises. Wear my daughter's sh- soccer sh- shin guards. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. <laughs> but that's where a lot of the ideas for this podcast came from. It did. Uh, I, I, we're in the park across the across the way here, and yeah. uh, some good discussions, some ideas. Yeah. And here we are a year later, and it's still going. Still going. And Cody bragging about wearing his daughter's shin guards. Yeah. Heck yeah. Whatever I can do to protect my shins is good. So, Brian, for me, what comes up is I wonder how, how have you felt about the last year doing, it looks like, you know, we've done about, what, seven episodes or so? I have been extremely happy with how it's gone, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, talking with you all about what, what I was interested in, what you all were interested in, you know, part of it was just like reaching the audiences with different voices than they had heard. Mm-hmm. And for me personally, it was about connecting with people that I wanted to talk to So on both fronts, I think we've succeeded in that. And I think the conversations have been very rich, super interesting, and I'm really looking forward about where it's going. So I feel like, and I should say, we haven't had as many episodes as we would have otherwise because my family and I were in Europe for five and a half months. So we were away and couldn't do the podcast. So that's why I hate the hiatus. But uh, during that time, I got lots of ideas, and so I have lots of ideas moving forward. But in general, I'm just super excited about where it's been and really grateful for the guests, especially who have been all fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, I believe all that. I've been struck by the uh, the wide range and the diversity of the clients, or not clients, of the people that you've been able to sit with and interview. It's been really neat. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Very meaningful conversations. And, yeah. and we'll get to that in a minute. I want to kind of recap the episodes so far because I think they've been very good. And um, I want to reflect on them. I want to mm-hmm. hear your thoughts. I also want to go back to the very beginning, which is the name of the, the podcast and the whole intention behind it. And, you know, that came out of lots of conversations and basically we had the three of us were chatting about it and we kind of pitched it to Cody to take a little time and come up with a cool name, <laughs> which you did, uh, Crossing the Chasm. And that for me has been super interesting because I start every episode asking guests about just that topic. You know, what is the chasm as they see it? And I really feel like that still works and is a really good name and a, a really nice foundation for the whole podcast. Mm-hmm. Oh, certainly. Yeah. Cody, shout out Cody crossing the chasm. <laughs> yeah, crossing that chasm. I, I guess I'd wonder what have you learned from the, maybe some of the guests in, in the chasm. And I'd wonder also, like, how is that chasm similar or different even a year later, you know? Yeah. I mean, well, first of all, everybody has had no problem answering the question because there's all kinds of problems in society. So that I think it resonates really well and it sets up nicely the whole impetus for the podcast, which is not only diagnosing what the problems are, but actually moving beyond them. 
And that has been really interesting because it, it allows people to really dig into their own interests, their own areas, but then also to kind of speculate and to think about what would a better world look like? And that mm -hmm. for me has been super interesting. Mm -hmm. The other thing about crossing the chasm as a term, which has been very useful, is that the, the basis for me has always been about connection and unfortunately the lack of connection in society. And I feel like every guest in their own way, either directly or indirectly, has also talked about that a lot, about, yeah, part of this is yeah, we have all these problems, but they, they emanate in some ways from the way we've organized ourselves and disassociated and don't have connection. So that's been super interesting as well. And I feel like, again, yeah, that the term really resonates with me. And so that makes it easy for, yeah, to keep working on it, to find guests and to think about crossing the actual chasm. Mm -hmm. Ca chasm has not been crossed. Chasm has not yet been crossed. <laughs> still <laughs> widening. Chasm still yeah. there. Listen, still you want to pick a topic that's not going to be uh, fixed overnight. You we want to make sure you have space for several <laughs> years of episodes. Yeah, so. <laughs> we get that. We, you know, what's interesting for me is you talk about the benefit of having that as a framework and that guests have been able to respond to that is, uh, I, I remember the dialogue that we would have when you were formulating ideas, you had a couple of different directions that you would go in. And for you, you're such a thoughtful guy. I remember we had a series of conversations over several times meeting and you'd kind of um, vacillate in terms of what direction you've gone in. And now in hindsight, how it's turned out. Yeah, it sounds like you feel good about that as a framework. Yeah, I was I was a little bit nervous, honestly, about finding guests. I don't know why exactly, but and I still am a tiny bit, but I was worried about, yeah, just the framework and whether people would resonate with it and if anybody would be willing to do it. But I, yeah, again, I just feel like it's been such a nice umbrella term that you can fit so many different people into that they actually genuinely relate to. Mm -hmm. And it's just led to these really interesting, thoughtful conversations, which has been extremely meaningful for me. Mm -hmm. So I just feel like I'm super excited about it. Mm -hmm. And you two have, you know, again, invited me in, had the conversations, you've hosted the platform, do a lot of work behind the scenes, which I'm very grateful for. The conversations have continually been super exciting and helpful and yeah, inspiring. So I'm curious, before we get into actually the episodes and the individual guests and so forth, you all had an interest in having kind of a podcast collective, and this was sort of the first foray into that. How do you all reflect on, on the podcast as, as it sort of started over this past year? Yeah, that's an easy answer because right here you're trying to set it up that the title somehow facilitated all the dialogue with these people. And so listening, <laughs> listening to your episodes, turns out it may be the framework and the title a little bit, but probably a lot of BP. So, uh, so for me, in hindsight, the idea, you know, um, I think we referenced this previously when we discussed, but Cody and I were intimidated to reach out to you, maybe some of the way that you talk about uh, having a concern for getting guests. And the conversation went so fluidly and, and spoke, spoke so poignantly to what I think goes on contemporaneously in U.S. culture uh, that, that in the days that followed, we were like, ah, we should reach out to him about setting up the podcast. And now seeing that product a year later, it's been incredible. The conversations have been helpful for us. We've even incorporated some of the concepts from the guests into the way that we run the Wellness Collective. Um, so it's been incredibly helpful in a practical way. And I think the framework and the title have, um, helped with that, but probably a, a minor component to compared to BP facilitating all that. So it's been incredible for us to listen to you take off with it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. I was going <clears> to <throat> say something kind of similar in that it's been rewarding to watch you develop it. And so I think there was the initial ideas and that sort of thing, but you've really taken it and run with it. Um, I've had the experience of like listening to some of the guests and feeling really, I don't know, I would say a sense of gratitude or gratefulness that even these interviews are somehow associated with us I'm mm -hmm. blown away. But like, <laughs> um, like when you were talking with Sama, I was thinking like, wow, Sama, was he in Germany or English? Yes, he was in Germany. In yeah. Germany. And I was just thinking like, this is incredible that Brian is talking with a person who's located in Germany right now. And somehow this conversation and Sama, what he's bringing to this. Uh, dialogue and his knowledge and life's experiences are somehow associated with this idea. And it's been really rewarding to see. Yeah. So I feel really um, excited about what has unfolded over the last year and excited about what uh, is to come for Crossing the Chasm as well. Well, I, thank you both. Again, I just wanted to say how grateful I am that you all brought me in and have supported this. It's been fantastic. And 
I have a little bit of a background and interest in radio anyway. So to have a podcast is like hugely important for me. So thank you both so much. I, I'm delighted to be here. And again, I think, uh, you know, this is a nice pairing. You all have your own uh, podcast, um, Beyond Flag, and that focuses mostly on Flagstaff and people here and the landscape and so forth, which is fantastic. It's a wonderful resource, you know, highlighting interesting people from the local community. And then mine is broader, mostly for people from not from the community, but there are definitely linkages and parallels in some ways. So I think it's just a nice, a nice mix and a nice pairing. Mm -hmm. Oh, certainly. I think... Uh... I think it's like what you explore beyond this area can be incorporated into this area. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, I think uh, I'm super excited about what's happened. I feel very good about it. Really grateful for the guests. And maybe what we should do is just take a look at a little retrospective and, and the episodes, because I do think they fit together, but are also interesting and in, in themselves and unique in their own way. I, you know, as you were just mentioning, I had lots of ideas about where I wanted to take this and I didn't know where to start. And I had, a, I felt some pressure about the first episode, you know, just starting it off and kicking it off. And so I just reached out um, to this, the transition U S website uh, that was just a, a, a broad website that was just like a catch all. And the executive director, Jessica Alvarez Parfrey actually responded to me and I asked her if she'd be interested and she immediately said yes. And that whole process, it went so smoothly and so easily and she was so kind and generous that it really set the stage for starting this podcast well. And then in addition to that, the content of what she said for me was just the perfect starting point mm. because she, she talked about the problems in society but just had this really passionate vision about a different world. Mm -hmm. And so it just totally set the stage and I really enjoyed our conversation. Yeah. And I feel like that, uh, you know, just l lent itself to getting the ball rolling a bit and, and building on that. Yeah. I was thinking that was a great first episode to get going. I, for me, I wonder what are, were there any specific things that you're mentioning? It seems like it really kind of set the framework for you and gave you a little momentum to begin rolling, but was there anything specific in meeting with Jessica that yes. really landed with you? The, the, and, and what it was had nothing to do with the content. It had to do with the fact that she presented such a genuine, heartfelt perspective mm -hmm. that ob obviously she just cared so deeply and it meant so much. And yeah, just she was so honest. Uh, that's what I loved. I really, and for me, you know, this, this podcast is a little bit different than some other podcasts. And what I wanted it to be was less about the person's sort of job or what they do day to day and more about their vision and their passions. And that's kind of a, a fine line to walk sometimes because, you know, in our society, many people are sort of, they're, they're sort of, yeah, their, their jobs really speak to who they are in some ways yeah. as opposed to the other way around. And so it was really nice to have somebody who just, just was speaking so honestly and openly. Mm-hmm. And it was just so moving. I just really, it was, and she had, what I loved too is that she had these sort of broad perspectives on why society and cities and so forth are not doing well. She had some specifics about the ways in which we could diagnose those problems and move forward. But then she also had some practical examples from Northern California where people were getting together and doing things differently. And that's also one of the things I love about the podcast is actually not just visions, but also examples of how people are doing things differently. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, highlighting and showcasing the way in which people can decide to act in their own communities in a way that brings people together and is intentional about changing things. So that was super exciting. Yeah. And I just felt like she was a really good speaker. Yeah. Yeah. And it was really engaging and yeah, I loved listening to her. Yeah, she. I can't remember if it was her for sure, but did she have the animal noises? That uh, was not her. That was okay. a different one. That was. <laughs> I love you mentioned that. I was thinking about that same thing. That yeah. was actually that Jess Rivington. Oh, Jess that was, yeah. yeah, she was okay. actually um, recording from her house, and there was a bunch of animals in the background. <laughs> okay, <laughs> which was lovely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So Jessica, I think um, that was just a wonderful way to start. And then I was thinking, you know, once that episode was sort of recorded i just got so excited and was super interested and then i really wanted to find somebody who could speak to an on the ground worldview that was really challenging the common discourse and the common structures of society and i found noni sessions of the east bay permanent real estate collective mm -hmm. and that episode totally blew me away honestly oh she was phenomenal she it's like she took um 
took concepts that come out of um, Western capitalistic ideals and then like manipulated them in a way to create a community and collective that's organically based, locally based, and creates resources available to communities that typically lack opportunity and resources. Yeah, I just found it totally inspiring. I mean, somebody who has a vision, who's working tirelessly, who is really engaged in their local community and and actually doing something to change it. I just felt like that was amazing. But then she also had this unbelievable sort of um, analysis of what was going on as well that paired with that practicality Mm -hmm. that just made everything so clear. I just found it extremely persuasive. It was one of those episodes where I just sort of said something and then she just took it and I was just like enamored with what was going on. Mm -hmm. And like, I felt like I was not the host of the show, but like was Mm -hmm. benefiting the Mm -hmm. whole time. It was Mm -hmm. just remarkable. I loved that. Yeah. She's got one of those, uh, like IQs, three or four standard deviations (laughs) above. Stuck in those blocks. Stuck in those blocks. Yeah. I was uh, really struck by her enthusiasm for me. It was just kind of like someone you're like, want to follow. Like, yeah, let's go. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I felt the same way. Yeah. And then, uh, she was the one that uh, referenced being a literal tree, literal tree hugger. Yes, I was just gonna I was just gonna mention that. Thank you so much. Yes. So I also want to mention that my uh, my friend Chris Flores has been instrumental in this podcast as well, behind the scenes and helping come up with ideas and so forth. And and he and I chatted a lot about how to end the episodes. And and we have I, I put together these three questions basically that we wanted to get a little more personal with people. And it was in one of those last questions where Noni was actually literally talking about how. She was yeah, doing a lot of work. It was hard. And so she, she talked about going outside and literally hugging a tree as, as a way of reconnecting and sort of finding a, a, a mental space beyond the, the challenges of the work she was doing. And again, I just felt like it was so honest and touching mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. personal. It was just really meaningful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Just a deep connection to herself and a deep connection to her work. Yeah. And others in her community. It's so inspiring. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Definitely an inspirational individual. I love that. And then we moved on uh, to the next episode, episode three, which was with Richard York, who is a professor of sociology at the University of Oregon. And I intended to not have many academics on the show, and I've only had one so far, but I really wanted to have Richard because, as I said in the episode, I think his work, his scholarly work is the most important of any academic working from my perspective. And Mm. it's just, it's really profoundly important. And he's also just really well-spoken and super interesting and just a, just a very kind person. So that was also a treat for me to talk to somebody who I kind of look up to. And, and he, you know, I think part of this podcast, you know, is really about diagnosing what's going on in the world. And I just wanted to have somebody who's a real expert in that. Mm -hmm. And it's different than sort of the, the personal stories so much and um, the on the ground community work. But I think education is quite important. Obviously I'm an educator and I do think that people who study these things have things to say and that it benefits society to hear about them, even though sometimes it's challenging and somewhat complex. But I think Richard's a very well-spoken, thoughtful advocate Mm -hmm. and did a really good job sort of situating all of that. Yeah. Richard was one of the first people you proposed interviewing uh, when we talked about people before you even began interviewing. It makes me wonder, uh, how did the interview go compared to what you expected and how did it go differently than you expected? Yeah, he was somebody that I was really, I mean, when I thought about the podcast, his, his name and, and face came up immediately. <laughs> so I was really excited when he said yes. And I think I was a little bit nervous, you know, I think there is a negative connotation with academia or something being termed academic as if it's not useful or not relevant or something separate from society. I guess I was a little bit worried that it would be um, the conversation would be too complex or not engaging or not not enough story or something. But I I found the conversation to be extremely engaging. And he, again, like all the guests, came to the conversation from his own perspective and his lived experience, his own... Yeah. Yeah. It's a situation which I, I think people can relate to. And and so I think the conversation uh, went a little bit better than I had anticipated simply because it was very free flowing and he had interesting things to say. I mean, I asked him specifically about the role of education in 
you know, society. I asked him about what is theory. Most people wouldn't think about that, but the whole point was to get a sense of why do academics do this work and is it relevant at, in any way mm -hmm. to the rest of the public? Yeah. And I think he, I think he made a pretty persuasive case that it's relevant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was nice. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he really challenged the notion. Uh, my brother has a saying that, that he likes to share with me often that says, uh, yeah, those who can't do teach. And those who can't teach, teach Jim. <laughs> yeah. That's from uh, School of Rock. Yeah. That's a Jack Black quote. <laughs> yeah. 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 So Richard put that to the test. Yeah. I think, again, there's just a lot of misconceptions about academia and academics. And I think the work that Richard's doing is very important and has all kinds of implications yeah. and is relevant for society, which is why I brought him on the show. And so I'm... I think it's very difficult to teach, first of all, and to teach well. Mm. It's very difficult to do research and to translate that into ways for other academics to use, but also the public to use. And I think Richard's a perfect example of the sort of public scholar, so to speak, mm -hmm. that is crossing those boundaries and doing exceptional work. Loved the conversation. I think he provided the kind of grounded, drawing on theoretical sort of angles that I, again, I think people need to hear, mm -hmm. you know, for us to understand what's going on and to move forward. And he was also, I mean, I loved it too. He was very honest. He basically said he's pessimistic, you know? Yeah. He's not, he's not. Yeah. The questions at the end, uh, <laughs> <laughs> left a little bit of a somber tone. They yeah. did. Yeah. But again, I think that that's his perspective. And I think it's important to hear those kinds of voices. I don't want to just have people parading through who suggest everything's going to be fine. Maybe it will, hopefully it will. But I want to hear from people who have all kinds of views, you know, and then that challenges us to consider them and, and think about the world in a different way. That's mm -hmm. the whole point. Yeah. When I listened to that pod, um, a question that came to my mind was the degree of influence that his work has had on your work. Yeah. And I guess I'd wonder if you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I, my own view on the so-called environment and so forth has just drastically changed over time. I mean, I think back to when I was a PhD student 15 years ago. And I just thought, I mean, I remember having conversations with people. I was like, if we could just get electric cars, you know, everything is going to be totally fine. And here we are with electric cars and everything is not fine. And so it was over those 15 years when my views just totally changed about what's causing the problem and what we need to do about it. And mm -hmm. Richard's work has just been, I mean, I remember reading his work from the first time. It was like, wow, my entire worldview literally changed, mm -hmm. you know, it's just profound which is the whole reason why academic, being an academic is so exciting because you read all the time and you know are constantly being pushed. It's not this whole notion that academics are dogmatic and only think one way. I mean, some people are like that, but that's true of everybody in society. But for me and others, we constantly, our, our views are being shifted and changed constantly. And it's people like Richard York who are doing this extremely important work and can write about it in a way that is just absolutely crystal clear. Mm -hmm. And then they have the evidence to support it. It's not... It's not just an opinion. He's been doing work for 20 years that is grounded in evidence and making claims about it that is just really persuasive. And mm -hmm. so it's just been unbelievably important for me and my teaching and writing and, and just being a citizen. You know, it's completely changed how I think I should act in the world and what our city should be doing and our, all of that. So it's just, yeah, I just really appreciate Richard. And again, he's just such a kind person too. It just makes it all the better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, for sure. University of Oregon, hashtag go lumber ducks, go lumber ducks. <laughs> Shout out Phil Knight and Nike. <laughs> Is BP to five? <laughs> Could be pizza five. Do you think? I don't know, man. I got one, man. <laughs> a one? You think so? Uh, one five. Yeah. Five. We got a whole language going over here, Brian. I Sorry. like it. I like yeah. it. Yeah. That was a great episode. I was really, yeah. um, Dan referenced us that we were intimidated to reach out to you. And I know that you were talking about reaching out to Richard early yeah. on. And I uh, just want to say you did the dang thing. Yes. Yeah. And I have to say, I'm thing. currently involved in a research project where I'm interviewing academics. And it's not easy. <laughs> and so I really appreciate it. They don't somebody. offer time. <laughs> they don't offer time. And yeah. Richard was just, again, he's just such a kind. The other thing I want to say just quickly is that he's extremely humble. His work is profound and is widely cited. And if you, mm -hmm. if you met him, you would never know. He's just like this down to earth, yeah. super nice person. That's so easy to talk to, which I just, again, really appreciate. Yeah. So that was, that was a fantastic yeah. episode. Yeah. It makes me wonder, Cody asked you one last question here. 
uh, Cody asked you, you know, what influence Richard's work had on you. I, I wonder what influence does your work have on Richard? I think uh, we are in very different spaces. He is at the upper echelon of academics. If, if, you, if you went to a, a sociology conference, every single person at the conference would know Richard York, literally. I mean, he is like a huge name. Yeah. He, he's so kind, though. He actually went out of his way to tell me that he uses one of my papers in his classes and the students like it. I mean, it's just like, it's so nice. You know? so, so, huh? It's just huh? so nice. Uh, so, huh? no, listen, I'm not influencing him in any way. He is <laughs> he just, so far beyond. Oh, jeez. <laughs> but he, yeah, he's just like, again, this is like down to earth, humble person who I really admire. So yeah. that was, that was a treat for me. Yeah. yeah. And then the next episode was the one you were referencing, which was the, um, the episode that had the, the sound effects in the backyard, which yeah. were real. Like there were goats, goats. and sheep. And, <laughs> that was phenomenal. Yeah. That was uh, Jess Remington. And I found Jess, um, she had uh, contributed a chapter in a book uh, that I, I had read and that was super interesting. And, and she works on something that I don't have very much in, uh, insight into or experience with, which is she's really interested in businesses and people in business and, and engaging with them. And so... Uh, she authored this book that came out after the episode had aired uh, called Beloved Economies. And she's just thinking about, yeah, what an economy is, how we fit in it, what does work mean? It was really interesting. And again, it was nice for me because, again, extremely kind person, well-spoken, thoughtful, but also talking about something that I didn't have a lot of experience in that I would thought maybe people listening might, given that a lot of people are working in the private sector. So that's why I was super excited about hers. Yeah. This, this episode is one that I probably listen to the most um, just because of the relevancy to what Dan and I do as far as running a business. And um, I found it so striking and interesting and I absolutely love the content that Jess produced um, and shared with everyone. We ended up buying the book Beloved Economies and it's had a profound, a profound impact, I'd say, on how we run uh, this business beyond the pines. It's fantastic. Uh, yeah, so it was really... It was really neat to see. I think sometimes I can get lost in big picture and think very macro, but she really shrunk things down into like micro economies and thinking about even in this small business in a small rural town in Northern Arizona that we kind of run a little micro economy. And so it's, um, I think it's had an effect on how we make decisions. Oh, certainly. Yeah. Like, uh, I think she scaled down, like, we don't need to think as economy as one big thing. Yeah. So you can look at your business and say, what does our economy represent? And then said, we don't need to get stuck in dichotomous thinking where it's either capitalism or socialism. Like, let's actually use our intellect and redefine how an economy can operate. So be intentional about what revenue comes in, how it comes in, and then how expenditures are made uh, with like a beloved intention. I'm just delighted that you yeah. all are, are saying this, that the, the podcast and her conversation has helped influence what you all are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, mm -hmm. that's like the, so good to hear that the podcast is reaching people. I mean, obviously you all have to listen. I mean, <laughs> but nevertheless, <laughs> no, that that we get to <laughs> with hers, honestly. So I think, I, I don't know if this is similar to what Cody was saying for me, Sometimes I can feel powerless thinking, well, I live in this economic economic system. And she helped me to feel empowered to say, oh, the way that I utilize money or come into contact or have a relationship with money, I can actually be intentional with it despite living in this macro system. And yeah, and we can live in a way that represents something more more aligned with uh, my morals and values than just try and operate based on what the broader economy dictates. Yeah, yeah I, I love that how she, she, well, first of all, what's so interesting is that she says she's passionate about microeconomics, which I just love, you know, she's not a professor or something, but she loves microeconomics and making this all, as you're saying, relevant to people in an everyday situation and thinking about our relationship. And what I really appreciated that she was talking about was how we all sort of make this system and we can unmake it and make it in different ways and it starts by having like you all 
in your own practice doing things differently. So I love the I love the fact that she had this broader view, but also a way forward for people in their everyday lives. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if you'd be okay, I could share two practical examples of how we've incorporated her work into what we do. In, in addition to just a decision making when people on our team approach us with requests or needs and that sort of thing, we really try to work to um, have values influence that. But one thing in her book that she recommended that people do is uh, have a check in at the beginning of team meetings to help create connection among the team. So we have a person on our team who basically comes up with a, a question and we all get a we all get a share. And it's been it's been fun to have questions that range from something that's super silly and lighthearted to stuff that's a little bit deeper. And uh, I think that's been connected for our team. And then another thing that she mentioned is, um, this is super new on our part too, but she recommended having, uh, commu- uh, like stakeholder groups that can have an influence and in a say on how businesses make decisions and that sort of thing. And so that led to us. Um, we want the original idea was to create, we refer to it as the Jedi Council, but it's the Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Council. And so what we've done is try to arrange and invite people from the community who have different backgrounds and voices than ours to help influence how we make decisions as a business as well. And so we've uh, just just launched that, I guess. You know, we've only had one meeting, but we have a lot of hopes and ideas for um, how that goes forward, just to have a more broad and inclusive voice overall in how things run. That is fantastic. I love that. And I'm going to reach out and tell Jess that because the other thing about her is that she was really interested in hearing reflections on her work and the book and so forth. So she, she will be totally delighted that this has reached oh, cool. you all and you're making some changes based on what she's doing. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. If you could send her a big thank yous on our part. Yeah, I definitely will. I'm oh, really yeah. grateful for her contribution to work for sure. Yeah, again, I just keep saying this, but she was so kind. Again, mm-hmm. everybody has yeah. just been unbelievably kind yeah. and, yeah. and was just really lovely to speak to. I also really love talking to Sama Abdallah, who um, is, he was, he's doing work that I, when I initially thought about the podcast, is somebody that I wanted to bring on, like him. And he's a well being expert. Uh, he previously was working for the New Economy Foundation in London. As you mentioned, he's in Germany. He's finishing up a PhD, but he knows a lot about well-being. I was like, wow, you know, we, we talk a lot about well-being, but I'm not sure everybody knows exactly what it is or how we should think about it. I, I certainly had questions. So talking to him was just fantastic because he has such a breadth of expertise in thinking about what well-being is, how you measure it, where it's happening. I really enjoyed talking with him and that whole process was interesting too, just behind the scenes. Like how do you connect with somebody in another country for a recording and so forth? But again, it all went super easy and he was extremely kind and really enjoyed talking, chatting with him. And again, this whole idea of well being is really something that I care deeply about and I'm interested in. So I, I just learned a lot from his, his um, interview for sure. Yeah. He opened my eyes. I actually was one of those people that understood like, uh, the countries like Finland, Norway, Switzerland, Sweden, I, I understood those to be the highest well-being. And he really reframed uh, incorporating many more variables, which allowed for a much broader perspective. Where is it? Puerto Rico? Where's the number one? Costa Rica. Costa Rica. Rica. Mm-hmm. It's usually Costa Rica. Yeah. yeah. And so Costa Rica, actually, based on a wider array of variables that are more comprehensive and allows for a much more nuanced perspective, uh, has the highest well-being. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, I just think it's so interesting. We, we talk a lot about, we all should be doing well, but we don't really know how to measure it or what it, what it entails. And we also have misconceptions about who's doing well, this tiny little country in Central America, they've done things over time in which they're just doing really well, you know, obviously there's problems everywhere, but you know, compared to other places, and so what, what uh, Samal is really about is like looking at the details. Why is it the case that in this particular place, people are doing better mm-hmm. than other places? Mm-hmm. And that's what's super fascinating to me. And it seemed like mostly it's because they're connected to what they're doing. So you can relate it on like subjective ratings of happiness, um, but that's like one variable. So that becomes one variable. And then it's like uh, time in other activities like outdoors or having your hands in the actual work of what you produce to uh, fulfill your needs. Um, yeah. And that, yeah. and it changes it. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's also a, an indicator about the extent to which environmental degradation is tied to societal mm-hmm. actions. So that, that links the environment and society. And then just in general, yeah. Like why are people doing well? Well, in part, they have a society where they're deeply connected. 
and there's just more and stronger social ties. So anyway, yeah, it's just like, I love that. And then like with all the episodes, then you can think about, well, what does that mean for my own community? You know, why is it that people are not doing as well here as they are in other places? And what could we do differently and think about connecting and so on and so forth. And so that, that to me is really the, the, the benefit of this whole endeavor, which is again, what are these broad insights and how can we think about them in our own personal life and our personal communities? Mm-hmm. Super exciting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's he's doing um, a, a lot of good work in his PhD, so I'm really curious to see where he goes and, and hope to kind of follow him. <laughs> yeah. And then the last episode that we've posted so far is uh, one that I thought was perhaps the most personal and in some ways the most touching and moving and mm-hmm. difficult in some ways, but it was Jessica Tovar, who is uh, with the Local Clean Energy Alliance in the Bay Area, and, and, and she's really working tirelessly on trying to get the power of energy production away from corporations and investors and to communities. Mm -hmm. And so that work in and of itself is super interesting. But then she has this personal history and this personal connection to energy production. And that was really touching and powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Do you have anything you want to share about that? I was just thinking that same thing, like uh, the, the degree of closeness of the of the topic to her life was striking. Yeah, and you could just see the correlation between lived experience and maybe how that influenced her to go forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I love just listening to her. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just listening to her was a pleasure. Yeah. yeah, I think different than anyone else you interviewed, she for me fit what you spoke about when we would have dialogue about what you wanted, and you said, "Well, I don't want just a bunch of academics talking from an ivory tower." Um, so she had this voice and it was in the words she used, like her vernacular, her tonation, intonation, um, that was a voice from East LA talking about incredibly complex and intricate, intricate concepts related to power and energy. And then to learn all that was motivated by personal lived experience and saying, we got to just do something different. It, she, yeah, the end of that one actually made me tear up um, the, the profound ways that her life and the lives of those in, in her family and around her have been impacted by big energy uh, is powerful. It's powerful. Yeah. And I really appreciated her, again, openness and honesty and, and willingness to share all of that. It's really personal, extremely difficult situation. And then, you know, she at the same time, I loved the way she was talking about how excited she is about the work being done. Obviously, lots of challenges, lots of problems. But she spoke in part of that interview around young people and her seeing young people, Mm. the extent to which they're taking this on and making it a serious issue and, 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 and weaving it into their lives in ways that's really profound. So she had this like pain and suffering that she endured and at the same time had this amazing optimism which i just really loved and Mm -hmm. and found very touching yeah i think that's something that also seems to maybe different than richard but with a lot of the guests he interviewed was there was this sort of optimism that exists and this hope i think that was interesting to to hear and also inspiring in that way absolutely i'm so glad you mentioned that because that's one of the things as i look back on all of these episodes and the themes that are emerging Yes, there's lots of problems, but there's so much interesting stuff going on that people find inspiring and hopeful. Yeah. And it's not going to solve all the problems overnight, but it is. it does speak to the fact that there is a lot going on. And the fact is we just don't hear about it, which yeah. is really what's motivating this podcast in some ways. It's mm-hmm. just once a month, not interviewing that many people, but but we are trying to elicit from people what they're inspired by and when you do that you see across all these interviews that there's just a lot going on Mm -hmm. and it's super exciting and that's gets back to one of the key components of the podcast which is this whole idea of connection Mm -hmm. and if we could start connecting all this good work that could really have some interesting consequences and i that's not the sort of the the purpose of the, the podcast but i'm hoping that there are some linkages being made they certainly are for me at least yeah i <clears throat> making those linkages i was just thinking like uh where does hope come from and i think of people engaging their work in a deep connective way produces that sense of uh hope toward the future knowing that even there are these grand problems that we were saying aren't going to fix themselves in a year or two uh and so for me when i listen to it it feels hopeful and engaging it, it, it creates for me the also the ability to step back and reflect on what we're doing which is also a uh 
I don't know, a, a useful process, I suppose. Absolutely. Yeah. Ways. And, and just to, to, to say this again, but I really feel like the hope emanates from the realization that people are doing things. They're challenging things. They're coming up with new protocols, ideas, strategies, programs, mm -hmm. which is why again, Noni's um, discussion was so profound because they're, yeah. they're trying to redo what we mean by real estate and property yeah. and private yeah. property. And that is just so inspiring and exciting. And I'm really excited about using that as a platform to move forward and to find more examples of that. Yeah, that's a great example. I, I think of like that field is something to feel very hopeless about. <laughs> Just kind of the way it is here, particularly. Absolutely. Yeah, and listening to Noni felt, listening to her engage her work and her community and have a profound impact was, it brought hope. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that was wonderful. So, so it's been a fantastic year. We've had a, a number of amazing guests. I have uh, a couple more episodes coming out that I just want to highlight really quickly. I um, Just in a couple of days, we're going to be um, posting the next episode, which you, you two haven't heard yet. Um, but it's with Jillian Rakusen, who is the executive director of the Coalition to End Social Isolation and Loneliness. Ooh, let's go. And that one, again, because of my, my real strong interest in connection, I was so excited that she... Uh, spoke with me. The conversation is fantastic. The organization is doing these amazing things. And it just, it's really honing in on the fact that we have a complete and total public health crisis mm -hmm. around loneliness and isolation and that people are working on it. So that's going to post in just a couple of days. And then uh, I also just did an interview with uh, Amanda Janu, who is a well being, with, she's with the Well Being Economy Alliance. And again, she just has this really interesting thought and a vision for a new kind of economy of just organizing ourselves differently. And so she speaks to that in just such an eloquent way. She's got a really interesting, varied background, lots of living abroad and so forth. So she has a really unique perspective. So that'll be uh, launching in a, a month or so. And so and we've got a couple things in the works. And then I've got a couple more episodes that I'm, I'm looking forward to um, doing uh, that I have guests kind of lined up. Uh, but I did want to just uh, before we end, you know, think about where we've been, where we're going. Um, and yeah, I'm just curious from you all if you have any thoughts about this. I mean, I'm still coming up with ideas. I'd love to hear from listeners for ideas, for topics. But given what we've covered so far, given the, the work you all are doing on your own podcast, yeah, I'm just thinking about what we should be considering as we move forward for topics or ideas or what worked, what hasn't, just just reflecting on the year and, and thinking about using that as a way to move forward. Yeah, well... One thing comes to mind is the guests you just listed that you have upcoming and in the, in the episodes that we reviewed uh, made me think, um, oh, yeah, these these individuals probably aren't going to be interviewed on cable news. <laughs> and so part of what I heard you and Cody talking about, B. Pete, is uh, that it produces hope to engage these ideas. And these are the ideas that get less airtime. And so thinking about that altogether is, oh, what this allows for is for me, I consider myself to be progressive in the sense that I want to look at what I'm doing, evaluate the outcome of what I'm doing comparative to what I was intending and then adjusting. Um, I never think I got it categorically figured out. And so uh, uh, these ideas, I think, allow for an evaluation of what's going on that is, doesn't always have to come across as critical. It's actually just an evaluation of what's going on look at the outcomes of this and then what can we do to adjust or adapt? And that's actually a personal philosophy that I have. So the way I would incorporate that into going forward is I love um, the new programs and ideas. And I kind of think of your work and what you're doing, my personal preference being in two categories. One is to hear about these people that create new programs or new ways of thinking. Like I think of Jess Remington in terms of economies, Noni in terms of um, housing, and Jessica Tovar in terms of power. And they take these different fields or contexts and they actually say, here's different ideas about what we can do. And they're in various stages of being able to incorporate that or trying to achieve uh, means for incorporating that. And, uh, and that's super powerful to hear. And then maybe most evident in Jessica Tovar is the second thing that's powerful for me is to hear the personal account. And so even if there are opportunities, I, I, I've said this to you, so I'm, I apologize for being redundant, 
But if there's opportunities to interview people that actually can convey the lived experience of what individuals are speaking to, hey, this is a thing we need to reevaluate, or people that are now living the new way, a progressive way of doing something, I actually love those firsthand accounts. So I love hearing about the different alternative ideas. And then secondly, I love hearing about the lived experience of either the new alternative idea or the impact of the current way of doing things. Yeah, that's super helpful. And I really appreciate that. That just sparks all kinds of ideas already about where to go with all of this. Yeah. And I, I really, I, I just really want to hear people with a different vision and also hear about opportunities to learn from people who are sort of engaging those new realities mm -hmm. outside the norm. And I really love the way you describe that. Like it's not gonna be on cable news. Yeah. That, I didn't, I didn't think about that way, but it makes so much sense. Yeah. We don't hear about these things enough. Yeah. I don't think I saw Sama on uh, Tucker Carlson <laughs> before <laughs> Tucker Carlson. I think he's going in a new direction, but um, <laughs> yeah, I didn't see him on there. I, I watched nightly. I know that you're a big Tucker fan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think you even wrote letters to Tucker, right? Just requesting that Sama be a guest. Yeah, I'm a stan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, we could we could go in a lot of directions with this one for sure. Uh, um, I, I was gonna, you know, for me, I was thinking topical, and um, I was just looking through like the top ten behavioral uh, or top ten trends that the American Psychological Association association has identified for areas for continued emphasis and growth um and some things that come to mind are like youth mental health um i, w I wonder what people are doing out there to help adolescents right now the um the rates of mental health diagnoses and disconnection i think for adolescents is skyrocketing it continues to go up there's a huge chasm there i would say um another thing that comes to mind is also gun violence and uh, just having a conversation with someone in my life the other day about uh, gun violence and we kind of framed it as like there seems to be a virus in society right and there's there's this thing where people are taking guns into social places and shooting people and i just i wonder uh in ways that we can you know continue to learn what's going on there and who's doing what about that sort of thing mm, wow interesting uh places to go from from a topical standpoint Fantastic. And I love both of those uh, because they're so prevalent and important and catastrophic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in desperate need of, I think, yeah, just alternative discussions. Mm -hmm. So I love that. And a part of it is for me, like I have this environment background, but I, again, talking about earlier about how my sort of views have changed, I just totally view this differently. We don't have a separate environment. It's all sort of intertwined. And the, you can't disassociate things like mental health and gun violence yeah. from all these other things going on. So it's not yeah. like this is an environment podcast. Yeah. I do hope to have episodes on these topics and others, which would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. and, and hopefully in a way that links them in people's minds. That's kind of the idea. Yeah, I think I think if we use the gun violence one, it's easy to think, oh, if we just had a policy to regulate that. And in actuality, across the world, policy doesn't always align with rates of mass shootings and so then it's like oh well what's going on here because if the data doesn't suggest if you regulate it it goes away then there's something deeper going on that speaks to what you're talking about the chasm is actually the way we live systemically that may create the desire to to do that or to perform that act and figuring that out is what's needed um absolutely and you know when we had our earlier conversations you know as this podcast was coming together we were talking about like my idea emanated in part from the fact that we have this society from which all these problems emerge. It's not that we have all these separate problems. They, they come from the same sort of foundation, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and that's maybe an overstatement, but you get the idea. And so that's why I think yeah, all those topics were fantastic and I would love to, to pursue them. I have a few other topics that I, um, I'm interested in. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd love to talk about alternative agriculture um, yeah. and ways of procuring food, both access and production. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually really interested in the issue of uh, immigration from a slightly different perspective and the ways it, you know, coincides with international policy, climate change, water availability, all those things. And to hear sort of somebody who can speak to personal stories. Uh, there's a few other topics that I, I'm, you know, consistently interested in around well-being and, and connection that I think we could go deeper into in different angles. 
So I have I have a bunch of ideas. Uh, I'm constantly drawing on you all, my friend Chris. I'd love to hear from listeners if they have ideas and mm-hmm. and yeah. keep this going. And I'd, I'd love to make this into somewhat of a, a conversation outside of the podcast itself in terms of what we're all interested in and what would be useful. And mm-hmm. so I'm hoping we can somehow facilitate that as well. Yeah. You've asked us these very thought-provoking questions, but I'd be curious about... Um, yeah. What do you see? How, how has your idea for the podcast evolved in the last year? And what do you see moving forward? Yeah, I think, you know, it's mostly I feel like I've stuck to my an initial plan pretty well. And I feel like I've found guests that really resonate. So that's fantastic. And now it's just like based on this conversation we're just having now about, yeah, how how can we take this in different directions in ways that I hadn't even thought about? You know, like the gun violence that might not have come up as a topic that I would have immediately thought of, but it makes perfect sense, you know, and adolescent health, um, mental health makes perfect sense. So I feel like for me, it was a little bit uh, of a challenge because I was nervous about doing it well and doing it right to begin with. And now that we're sort of going, it feels like it's doing pretty well. I feel like it's now time to kind of branch out a bit Mm -hmm. and think about this slightly more broadly. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and that's what I'm excited about. And I'm going to keep this conversation going with you two, of course. But that's, so I don't know where it's going to go. It's just kind of exciting. I don't mm-hmm. have a clear path or plan for every single episode. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of just constantly thinking about what am I interested in? What do I think would speak to the broad aims of the podcast? Mm-hmm. What are conversations I'm hearing from other people that seem like a topic might make sense to address things that other people are thinking about? Mm-hmm. So that's what I'm excited about. I love the idea that it's not set in stone, it's not super narrow, which has its downsides as well, of course. (laughs) But I think that is just a lot of potential promise. Mm -hmm. There's just a lot of different ways it could go. And and for me personally, I'm just super excited about, yeah, talking to more interesting people and engaging these issues in ways that I hope are, you know, meeting people in their daily lives in ways that that resonate. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. That's uh, I don't know, listen to you. I feel excited. Yeah, so we call you the Pod God for a reason. <laughs> B Pete, the Pod God, <laughs> LFG. Do you remember? Do you yeah. remember when B Pete, when we were first meeting, he's like, "Are you sure you two are willing to be aligned with me? Like, he, like he's going to be this agitator, and our, yeah. our, our everything we do is going to go under because uh, people." Pi God's going to subvert the whole thing. Yeah, people yeah. are going to come in hot. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the ideas you have, BP, it's the direction we need to go. We appreciate your voice. Well, I just, again, want to conclude by thanking you both again so much for the support, the kindness, the ability to you know, have this podcast with you all under this collective and yeah, to keep these conversations going. I really appreciate it. And all, and all the, again, the behind the scenes work that you all do that you don't get much credit for, but I, I, I greatly appreciate it. Thank you both so much. You actually give us too much credit at the end of every episode. <laughs> yes. I, I like that executive producer title. I'm gonna that's gonna make its way onto my C V for sure. It should, for absolutely. Sure. C V C V. It's yeah. uh, executive producer crossing the chasm. And also then, title originator. Title originator. And then on the other podcast it's gonna say show host, uh, one star podcast. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's an impressive. Document. I would lead with that's the executive easy. producer of Crossing there. the Chasm. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's going to be give yeah. you more more credit, no doubt. Well, I, yeah, I, I don't know, Brian. I was just going to say, for me, this is really fun. I just enjoy doing this, and it's been a pleasure to do this with both you and with Dan. Um, I, I look forward to seeing how it continues to unfold over time, and uh, also feel grateful for your willingness to engage the process and uh, put something good out into the world. Well, yeah. thank you. Thank you both so much. I really appreciate it. The first year is under our belts. It's been a great year. I think we've got a good foundation for moving forward. I'm excited about where it's going. Uh, Dan and Cody, thank you both so much for joining me today. It's been delightful to talking with you. Thank you so much, BP. Let's go grab a high chew. Yeah, party on late for the train on a Thursday. High chew it is. All right. Thank you both so much. Take care. What a nice opportunity to have a chance to talk to both Dan and Cody about the one year anniversary of this podcast. Super grateful for them both. Great to chat with them. They are both executive producers, as you know. I do want to thank again Chris Flores from Behind the Scenes Work, as well as Anodyne Diversion for the music. And as always, thanks to you all the listeners. I appreciate you. Thanks for listening. I hope you tune in again. Take care. (laughs) 